I'm the dean of the, the doctorate program at Henley Putnam University. Um, I have my, my PhD in industrial psychology with a focus in workplace violence. So I was working with the university at a, a part-time basis and also working full-time in the security profession. Two years ago when the dean position became available, um, I applied for that and now I'm full-time with the university. So I run the strategic security and protection management program, the doctorate program, which is the only security program in, the only doctorate program in security is the, the DSS, um, and also the research program for the university. There are um, three programs, one in, in terrorism, one in intelligence management, and then one in, in strategic security and protection management at the master's and the bachelor's level, and then the doctorate program. So the entire university is, is fully focused on strategic security, it's the only university that focuses only on security, and we're 100% online and all of our, our students are security professionals in, in some form or fashion. Um, everyone goes through a background check and all of our uh, professors are also practitioners. Interestingly, the university was founded just prior to 9-11, just prior to it. And so the focus has and always will be on, on the prevention aspect. The, the courses are actually designed by the faculty um, and, and I was one of the faculty and I, I do still teach. So it's very much designed by practitioners and for practitioners. I've been in security literally my entire life. Um, I started in, in uh, high school as a intern in, in law, thinking I was gonna go into law. And uh, I wasn't really cut out for, for law so much as, as the law enforcement aspects of it. And I started working in retail security and found that I had a bit of a penchant for the investigations. And so all through college, I worked in retail security and then worked my way up and stayed in retail. And that's how I found ASIS, was through retail security, and then found that, that I had more of, a, of an interest in the prevention than the law enforcement piece. So I went in, in retail security and then I moved over into banking. I was a corporate security director in banking for many years and then in other financial services. And so I kind of moved around in, in the security profession, got my CPP, got my master's, got my PhD, all within security, staying within the security profession as opposed to law enforcement, working with a liaison with law enforcement, obviously. Um, and it kind of grew from there. So between uh, my, my professional aspirations and then through the, the things that you get exposed to within ASIS with the, from the leadership aspects, uh, I was, um, on the, uh, the local chapter in, in Washington, D.C., and worked my way up through ASIS, kind of as my career was blossoming, so was my volunteer leadership activities with ASIS, um, which afforded me the opportunity to see things and do things that you can't do as a, necessarily in a, in a career. It's kind of like a, a dual path, if you will. Um, so I've been on the foundation board. I was on the certification board. I was president of the certification board. I served on the board of directors for, for six years, the, both terms. Um, and now I'm still involved in, in ASIS at the national level. I'm on, I'm on the PAC, on the Political Action Committee. I stay involved in certification, which is something I really believe in, the, the certification program. Um, you get involved in, in things at an international level through ASIS that complement your career. Um, and so it allows you to kind of move around within the security profession in, in such a manner that you may not be able to do without having the complement of a professional association helping you along with your career. So when I say I've been in, in security my entire life, I, I really mean that. Um, and then after I got my PhD, it allowed me to go into the, onto the academic side, but I'll still always consider myself a practitioner because the university is so ingrained in the practice of security as opposed to the academics of security. It blends very nicely. I am seeing more, more women in, into, uh, coming into the security profession. Um, the best advice that I can give is that you have to be as good or, or, or better. Um, and, and not to say that I'm a feminist because by no stretch of the imagination am I a feminist. Um, I don't think that you should get a break. I think you have to be as, as good or better. Um, you should have your education, you should have your CPP or PSP or, 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 CP or whatever you want to have, some sort of, of certification if, if you want to go into the computer side of it and have that certification or you want to go into investigations, you want to have that, whatever you want to have, you have to have the same credential. You have to have the same education, you have to have the same um, experience and you have to be just as good or better. The security profession I think is growing and changing, it's ever changing and it's such a multidisciplinary profession. It's not as accepted out, outside of our own profession as, as other professions. It's like you know people get a CPA and everyone knows what that is. Um, not everyone knows what a CPP is yet 
but it's going to take more people having the credential, more people um, being proficient in this, in in it being a security professional. Um, other initiatives like the ASIS having standards and guidelines and having international um, uh, ISO standards and those sort of things that are being recognized by other professions in order for the security profession as a whole to be to be recognized. Um, every profession has to have a body of knowledge, which is something that we don't have yet, but are working on it, where it has to be recognized outside of the profession. So I think as a as an industry moving towards a profession, and I use those words. Uh, very deliberately. Um, there is still the, the industrial piece of security, but moving towards a profession as, as those of us who are practitioners professionalize it so it becomes more of a profession. But it has to be a de very deliberate movement um, where, where the things that we do are very much based in practice and research so it can be validated and, and reliable. Um, and we are moving in that direction. I, I definitely see a professionalism of security, if you will, where you, have, you see CSOs, where they are recognized as professionals, where it's not that guards and guns mentality. There's still some of that, but we've kind of moved away from it a little bit, where the security professional is truly the recognized professional. We're hearing more and more of the standards that are being um, adopted um, internationally, and ASIS is, is working on those in partnership with other organizations, as, as you're aware, um, not only from the federal government, the U.S. federal government side, but also at the, in the international side. And so we're seeing more of that where, where there's no more borders, right? Uh, literally no more borders. Um, and I think as we see more of, of that happen, security as a profession will indeed be more accepted outside of the security, uh, uh, outside of security as an industry. Um, and that people will start to understand what security is really all about because if, is, if we as professionals don't, don't enforce those, those standards and guidelines upon ourselves, someone else will. Some other industry will, especially when it comes to things like physical security or the, um, the electronics or the, you know, the, the cyber piece of it because it's always evolving, always changing, especially from the technology perspective that changes so quickly that if we don't do something to enforce that and set our own standards, something else will happen that will affect us, that, that we'll, we will be forced to comply. That's a great question. Um, it got better um, after 9-11 because people here woke up. Um, not as good as it, ha as it needs to be, um, but the, the communication definitely got better between the public sector and the, and the private sectors. Um, it's st there's still a long way to go because there's, there's still a lot of, of technical issues that, that haven't been worked out and there's still some, some silos, there's still, still some things that haven't been, been resolved. From, but it, there are some pockets and, and I think that's where a lot of the networking comes in where it really does come down to some communication issues. Um, it's, it's not perfect by any stretch, but it, it did go a long way after 9-11. In terms of technology overall, it's obviously moving very fast. Um, Certain industries tend to move much faster than others, and it's obviously the ones that are willing to put the money behind it. Here in, here in Nevada, in Southern Nevada, the biggest industry, as we, you know, is casinos and gaming. Um, very slow to put money behind that sort of thing, um, to their own detriment. And, and as you know, my husband is in that industry, so I hear about that all the time. I also worked in that industry, so I suffered for it as, as well, probably 10, 15 years behind the times. Other industries, some of those that are they're more high tech and I'll say a little more cutting edge, tend to be East Coast based for whatever reason, very much like, like other things around in the way the United States, uh, for whatever reason, geographically, the East Coast tends to be ahead of the game when it comes to those sorts of things. Um, and and we, we really need to be. Um, we need to be a little more progressive when it comes to um, technology. From an industry perspective, um, I personally am, am not an expert in all the industries. I can just say from, from, from looking at it, from, from what I read and from talking to from my colleagues, um, it's those professionals, those, those individual security professionals that have the influence within their organizations that can, can influence their own organizations that are more successful, that are willing to listen to what's going on out there and they're willing to embrace new technology that are really more successful that are with organizations that are more progressive, that are more uh, forward thinking, that are willing to embrace new technology and, and, and understand how quickly things change. And it's not one industry really over another. Um, it does seem to be sort of in pockets. Um, but in my own opinion is I think people can influence it a lot. It really comes down to leadership skills. I know folks that have been successful in different industries, but it really comes down to their own leadership 
capabilities and their ability to influence within their organization. I think one of the, the key things you're going to see this year in particular is um, we have the first international, or I should say non-U.S. president this year. Um, Edward M. D. is from the Netherlands. And, and as you noted, we changed the name officially several years ago. And instead of actually saying out American Society for Industrial Security, it's ASIS. Uh, and we're adamant about that. It truly is international. There are 38,000 members worldwide and um, over 20, I think it's over 27 or 28 percent of the membership is from non-U.S. And interestingly, I'm, I'm on the foundation board. And so I can tell you that um, over 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 25 percent or over 30 percent of the of the um, fundraising of the donations for the foundation come from overseas or come from non-U.S., which I found very interesting because that didn't take very long for that shows that shows me as somebody on the foundation board that tells me that that non-U.S. see the value in research and education um, probably quicker than a lot of our own uh, US, <laughs> U.S. members do. So um, I, that that was that was quite interesting. Um, that, that they put such a value on, on education and research that they would contribute to the, um, to the foundation as soon as they were eligible. The major conference is this year, the one in London, the European conference starts tomorrow. Um, then there's the annual seminar and, and exhibits, uh, which is, has always been in the U.S., is in, in Philadelphia in September. Um, there's the one in Hong Kong, which you mentioned, it's the Asia-Pacific. Asia and then um, there's the Middle Eastern conference, which I believe is in Dubai this year. Um, and so those four major ones, and then of course the New York is a regional conference, which started by the with the um, New York chapter, which has taken on a life of its own. It's huge. Yeah, we are seeing a lot of activity in, in Asia Pacific, um, and um, I, I don't know the numbers off off the top of my head. I'm I'm sorry, but we're seeing a, a lot of uh, of increase in um, uh, the Middle East and in Europe as well, which is probably due to the influence of our of our new president as well. Um, and very diverse, very diverse topics, very, very different from what you're going to see, such as the agendas at the conferences um, at, in, the, in the United States. The agenda is, is, is all over the board. When you go to a conference in, in, in say, Europe or um, the one for um, Hong Kong, it'll be on two or three tracks. It'll be very focused. And it'll be very different from what you would see in, in the U.S. And that's very much driven by the, by the local issues, by what's going on. Our members in the, in the in the U.S. are looking at the, the business aspects of what's affecting the, the U.S. business and trade as it's on a more international scope, which I can tell you probably 10 years ago, our members didn't look at it that way, um, but now they're looking at it from a much more global perspective because they, they really have to. Thank you very much for joining Thank you very much. All the best. Thank you. Thanks.